I'm Brett Terry. I'm one of your pastors here. Probably you knew that already, but just in case, I'm glad you're with us this morning. We're going to be continuing our study, 1 Timothy 5, 1 through 16. Um, you can turn to that in your Bible or if you have a, an app on one of your devices and you have a Bible app, I'll be in the ESV. So if you want to sync up with the same translation that I'll be reading from for the majority of the time. Also, if you don't have a Bible of your own or if you don't have one this morning or a device or something, there should be a Bible under your chair or one near you, and you can uh, grab one of those. If you don't have a Bible of your own, please take that. That's what it's there for. We, we want you to have a copy of God's Word. We'll be on page 992 in those Bibles. Um, the last two words that we had up there on that little video was do love. And I think for many of us, and because of the influence of the culture around us, we define love oftentimes as a feeling, as an emotion, as a sensation. But God, who says, I am love, doesn't define it that way. As we look through scriptures, He reveals Himself through the person of Jesus. Love for God is an action. It's not primarily a feeling, it's an action. And so, God, who created us, He says, I'm love. He says, I've created you, and because of that, I've created you to be like me, and we've messed that up. We've marred it, and um, we've sinned, and we've separated ourselves from God. He says, but I, I act in love towards you. I show my concern, my compassion for you in that I sent my son to make it possible for you to be back in my family. And so, if we're not careful as we look at these instructions that that Paul writes to Timothy, and really it's God's instruction to us as a church family, as the family of God, with God as our Father and Jesus as our older brother. If we're not careful, we turn this into a list of to do. Do this, do this, do this. Because really, and we sang it in the last song, we look at and see who God is, who He is, who, what His character is, and that's the basis on which He acts. We see what He does because it's based on who He is. And when we understand who God is, and then we see how He acts, and particularly in the person of Jesus Christ, then that helps us understand who we are in Jesus, and that will inform how we act. But if we're not careful, we turn it around and say, well, if I do this, 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 and this, then I'll be a Christian, and God will love me and accept me, and basically we've become our own Savior when we do that, which isn't going to work. <laughs> so it's a problem. So I wanna, we're going to look at the text here in just a second, but I just want to briefly review what was running up to this in the last chapter. Andy hit some of this last week. But in, in verse 11 of chapter 4, it says, Timothy is told, command and teach these things. These are needed instructions for us because God created us to live in community and to defer to each other in humility. Um, he does that not so he can get all the glory, like, oh, I can't let anybody in, steal my thunder. It's not that at all. It's part of the very character of God. Within the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, they d defer to each other. The Father glorifies the Son. The Son glorifies the Father. The Holy Spirit glorifies the Son. The Son deferred to the Father and came to earth so that we could be reconciled, ransomed, and brought into God's family. The Holy Spirit was then sent by the Son. See, see how that works? And he says, so it's not like, oh, I'm, I'm telling you to do something. He says, out of who I am, and I've created you to be like me. So, when my life is in you because I've given you my spirit because of what Jesus has done, that life should be bubbling out. But I know you're broken and messed up, so here's some specifics on how it looks. So it's not a to-do list. It's showing us this is what the life of Christ looks when it, like when it's bubbling out of us. So he says, listen, this is needed instruction for us. In verse 12 of chapter 4, he, Timothy was dealing with some bias because of his age. The older people are saying, hey, listen, you're not old enough to tell us stuff. You don't have enough life experience. You're not smart enough. You know, and Timothy was a competent guy. He was a church planner, consultant. He'd worked with Paul. He's kind of a troubleshooter. So that wasn't the issue. And, and Paul reminds him, he says, listen, Tim, s some people are going to say that stuff. But the deal is this, verse 13, if you look at it, he says, this isn't based on who you are, how old you are, or what your experience is, or your intelligence level, or how eloquent you are. This is based on what God says. So keep it sourced in the Word. Your authority comes from God, what God says. That's what you're passing on. It's not about you, really, and the people that want to make it about you. You can just breeze past that because keep them focused on God's Word. And he says, also, don't forget this. It's not based on your age or life or experience. In verse 14, he says, it's based on how God has enabled you to function within His family. 
So you just do what God wants you to do. People that want to try to ignore what you're telling them that God has to say to them and instruct them in just because of your age or this or that, you know, they don't like the way you comb your hair or they don't like it that you don't have hair or whatever, you know, the thing is. He says, you can ignore that and just move past because you're functioning off of what God says, His authority, and on His enabling for you to fit into His body, His family. So, let's read the text, 1 Timothy 5, 1 through 16. Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters, all in all purity. Honor widows who are truly widows. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. She who is truly a widow, left all alone, has set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. Command these things as well, so that they may be without reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Let a widow be enrolled if she's not less than 60 years of age, having been the wife of one husband, having a reputation for good works. If she's brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, and has devoted herself to every good work. But refuse to enroll younger widows, for when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry, and so incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith. Besides that, they learn to be idlers, going about from house to house, and not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies, saying what they should not. So, I would have younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households, and give the adversary no occasion for slander. For some have already strayed after Satan. If any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Let the church not be burdened so that it may care for those who are truly widows. Let's pray and commit this next little bit of time to the Lord. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit who not only teaches us what your word has to say, but enables us to live that out, the very life of Christ in us, in the person of the Holy Spirit. We know that you've created us to be like you. You've made that possible through Jesus for us to be brought back into your family, to have your spirit within us. So as we listen, help us to respond to you as we see who you are and then how that causes you to act, that it might also help us to understand who we are in Jesus and that it would inform how we act as we interact with each other and those around us. So we're trusting you for that. If there's anything that I say that hinders people from hearing what you have to say or detracts or distracts from that, just pray that you'd block that out or keep it from even coming out. And We're looking to you for that, asking you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Back in verse 1, Paul says, okay, Tim, you're dealing with some people that you know, don't want to listen to you because of your age. He says, so I'm going to give you some, some personal tips, and this is good for any of us, not just church leaders, on how to interact with other people. This is especially valuable within our church family, but it would really be helpful probably anywhere. He says, so here's what you do. First of all, verse 1, don't rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Okay, first of all, let's hit this. Can an, a younger man be in leadership over an older man? Well, it's pretty obvious, right? You, and by the way, you can nod your head and humor me and make me think you're listening. Yes, younger men can be in, because that's the situation here, right? The context. Timothy's a younger guy and he's having some blowback from older people, older guys. He says, so here's what you do. When you're in that position of leadership, if you're dealing with an older man, treat him like a father. Encourage him like a father. In Hebrews 13, 17, it says this, obey your leaders and submit to them. For they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. No matter how old you are, if you're in leadership, um, he says there's going to be an attitude of humility there. But he says if you're under leadership, and we all are at, at various times, he says obey them and submit to them, especially in our spiritual family, God's family. He says they have an important task. They are keeping watch for your souls. And there's enough difficulty in that, you don't have to create more problems for them. And so here's a test for you and I. When, when leaders see you and I coming, what do we provoke in them? Joy or groaning? <laughs> you know who you are. <laughs> okay? So he says that's, that's the, the attitude that we want to see there. It doesn't matter how old you are or how young you are. How should I treat a father? Well, God's laid this out, and he uses family terms all through Scripture. He created man and woman, to be a family, so we're developed with that community just like God Himself has within Himself. 
And he says, this is what you're created for. And it's so important that back in the law, the Old Testament law, when God was giving instruction for His people on how they should interact with each other, in the top ten commandments, the big ten, it's not a football league, it's the ten commandments, he includes, isn't it weird that he has stuff like, don't kill people, don't try to grab their stuff, don't lie about them, and then also honor your mother and father. Some of us would look at that and go, well, that seems out of place there. That doesn't match. He says, this is very important. It's critical because that's how I designed you to live. And so what does it mean to honor your mother and your father? And in particular here, he's talking about older guys' fathers. See, some of us grew up, and I, I had this problem when I was younger. As I got into my uh, early 20s and started walking with the Lord and looking at what He wanted me to do, and I grew up in a Christian family, but... Um, there were things I didn't agree with my dad about and his perspective on life. And then as I started looking at going into ministry and, and doing what God wanted me to do, I actually probably got more opposition from my parents about going into ministry than I did other people who weren't even believers at all. For, and I'm sure they had some good reasons. But, and so that made me feel like, just because of how I was thinking, I was thinking respect and honor means I look up to you, I agree with you, I take your advice. And that's largely how our culture defines respect and honor. And watch, and I was just talking with someone this week, and they said, yeah, that's how I think of it. If we do that, if it's only somebody that I say, hey, I'd like to be like them, I really value them, I, I think they're a great person, what's the problem with that standard for respect and honor? We're all sinners. So if that's our standard, then I'm going to be very limited in who I'm going to respect and honor, aren't I? God says, no. I want you to do this. It doesn't mean you agree with them. It doesn't mean they're right all the time. It doesn't even mean you have to take their advice all the time. But I want you to treat them with respect and warmth because of who they are in your life. In this case, your father and your mother. It might be government leaders. You, you can see how this is broken down totally in our society, right? We have very little respect <laughs> going on in our, in our culture, in our society. And so with my dad, I, I had that kind of a thought. and Some older, wiser men pointed that out to me and said, no, that doesn't mean you treat him with respect and you treat him with warmth of relationship because of who he is, is your dad. doesn't mean you agree with him all the time or that you have to do everything he tells you to do, but you have a right attitude. Boy, that changed my relationship with my dad. He says, so how do you treat your father? Honor your father and mother. Give weight to them. That's what the word means, to honor. It's that relational warmth. It's that respect because of who they are. God's placed them in your life. In verse, uh, 1 Peter 5, 1 through 3, talking to leaders, it says this, no matter what your age, if you're a leader, especially in the church family, it says, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that's going to be re revealed, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And Andy talked about that some last week, about Timothy being an example. He says, listen, no matter what your age, if you're in leadership, you do this not because these people are particularly lovable or worthy or deserving of this kind of godly concern and compassion and leadership. He says, you do it because you're serving King Jesus. That's why you do it. You do it not so you can get something personal out of it because you're working in His kingdom. You do it not, you know, getting crabby and irritable because they're not paying attention. You do it because you see how God has been gracious to you. Does that make sense? doesn't matter where you are age-wise. And then a few verses later, he says this, 1 Peter 5, verses 5 through 7, "'Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. Who's supposed to do that? All of us.'" doesn't matter your age. doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman. He says everybody needs to have an attitude of humility to defer to one another. Uh, when I submit to somebody and you submit to somebody, doesn't that imply that you don't agree? Shake your head. Yeah. yeah. If, if I come home and my wife has made a pie and she says, listen, you're going to sit down and eat a couple pieces of that pie with ice cream on it. No submission is involved. I wanted to do that anyway. You know, that's not a problem. But if she says, no, you can't have that right now. You need to wait till later. You can't have that many pieces because it's not good for you. Then submission comes in. I have to defer to her. Same idea goes into place here. It says, if you're younger, 
Submit. All of us actually need humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Again, I want to remind you, it's not because God says, yeah, I don't want anybody horning in on my spot here and stealing my thunder. He says, my very character is I'm humble. I don't think, see, some of us think, oh, humble means I walk around acting like, oh, I'm worthless, I can't do anything. That's not what humility is. Humility is I don't think more of myself or less of myself than I am. God doesn't think more highly of himself than he is. He says, That's, and since I've created you to be like me, I want you to have that same thing, and I've given you my spirit, the very life of Jesus in you, so that that should be bubbling out. That's what it's going to look like. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. He's in control. That's the bottom line. It may not look like it at times to me. I look at my government or my family or my church or whatever, go, I don't know about these people in, in, in leadership. They seem like knuckleheads. <laughs> God says, well, yeah, sometimes it looks that way, so cast your cares to me. I'm in control. Remember, I'm in control. Do you believe me? So humility is basic for how we interact with each other as a family of God, those of us that are in his family, seeing ourselves as we ought to. And then he goes on, he says, well, what about... Um, Brothers, then, you got older men, treat them, encourage them like fathers. Younger men as brothers. Well, with brothers, it's more open, but it's not a superior attitude. In the culture that he was speaking this into, the best of the culture, not the bad examples, there was a lot of loyalty, protection, and assistance among brothers as family. And some of that persists in our culture to varying degrees. He says, so it, it's important that you interact as brothers with each other. And Jesus spoke about this. It's in your supplemental notes, Matthew 18. He says, it's important. If you know something's wrong between you and your brother relationally, get it straightened out. It's so important that if you don't get it straightened out, it's going to affect your relationship with your father, God. In Matthew 23, 8, he says, don't try to be big shots and use titles with each other. and go, Look, I'm more important. I'm Dr. So-and-so and blah, blah, blah. He says, no, just be brothers. Let Jesus is the big shot. He's your older brother. Let him take that spot. You don't need to worry about being big shots with titles with each other. And then in Hebrews 13, 1, it says this, let brotherly love continue. Not, not warm, fuzzy feelings, but the actions in how we interact with each other. And by the way, Jesus said, how will people know that we're his followers, that we're in his family? By the love that we have for each other. And again, not because we feel all warm and fuzzy and emotional when we see each other, but how we interact with each other. Love is an action. Then verse 2, he goes on and say, well, what about older women? We'll treat them like mothers. Well, how do we treat mothers? Well, from what we've just seen, it's very similar to fathers. They want, we need to treat them with warmth, with respect, not, oh, you're too old to do anything but do my laundry when I come home and bake cookies. You know, That's not what older women want, is it? Older women, you should be going, yeah, that's right. <laughs> No, we, they want to be valued. They want to be treated with warmth and respect, correct? He says, so do that. Younger women, he says, how about them? Well, treat them like sisters. And in, in the culture, again, that they were speaking of, and some of that persists in our culture, normally sisters were protected by their family, by their brothers, from those who would try to exploit them or take advantage of them or abuse them. And he says, so treat them like sisters, but we also understand we're in a broken world. It's messed up. He says, so in all purity. He says, don't let there be anything inappropriate in your talk, in your actions towards the younger women who are your sisters. He says, treat them like sisters, but in all purity. Make sure you keep it the way God intended for the family to be. Don't deteriorate to the level of those around you sometimes go. And then verse 3 kind of switches tracks a little bit. It's really expanding on it in a particular um, instance here, something that he wants to to give instruction on. He goes from general interpersonal relationships. He says, okay, now what about women who are widows? Widows in the biblical sense that there's no one to support them, they, their husband's gone, their family is gone, or they've abandoned them and they're left alone. He says, well, okay. Here, and if you want a little kind of a condensed philosophy of that, James 1.27 says this, religion that's pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. He says, if there's a, an older woman and she's alone and nobody's there to support her, we need to honor her. We need to, we need to act towards her in some ways that shows that she's respected, honored, valued and be a help to her because that's what family's for. And uh, verse 4, he says this, 
If a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. This letter is practical instruction for believers, for the family of God. So we, you and I should not be surprised when people around us don't do, pay attention to this and don't do this. This is for us. And, and if we act this way, is it going to be different from a lot of what's going on around us? Yeah. And people go, why would you do that? And then we go, well, because of who God is, and then this is the way He acts and how He acts towards us in love, compassion, graciousness. And so because I'm in His family now, I have the life of Jesus in me, and so I can live this way too. And it gives us opportunities to share the good news about Jesus. So our responsibility for those of us that are believers, if we have parents or grandparents that are in need of assistance in physical things, material things, financial things, what does He tell us to do? Do it. And some of us will go, I don't know if I want to do that. Well, Jesus refers to this in, in Mark 7. We're, we're not going to turn there, but there were some religious teachers who thought they were very spiritual, knew a lot about God's Word, and Jesus talks to them, and He catches them on this thing, and He uses this as an example, which is kind of interesting. He says, you know the law. You know what God says. You know it very well. You could quote it to me. He says, you know the commandment that says, honor your father and mother. And also, and this is how serious it was back in Israel's economy, he says, there's another law that says this, and God gave it. Anyone who speaks disrespectfully of father and mother must be put to death. <laughs> I mean, God took it serious. He says, but you say it's okay if, if someone says, well, you know, I've got the financial means to help my parents, but I don't really want to use it for that. So here's how you can get around it, and that's what these guys were promoting. They didn't do it openly, but secretly. They said, listen, just put it in a trust fund and say it's dedicated to God. And then you go, oh, I'm sorry, parents. I know you need some help, but this money that I could have used to help you, it's been set aside for God, so sorry, I can't do it. And Jesus says, you know what you're doing when you do that? When you're looking for ways to avoid doing or get around what God's told you to do, he says you're breaking God's command. You're ruining the picture of God's family. And God doesn't take it lightly. He says, and there's a lot of other stuff you do like that, and it's weird to me that he picked that as his illustration. He goes, there's a lot of other stuff, but I'm going to stick with that one. So you get that. So verses 5 and 6, he says this, if she's truly a widow, if there's a woman that's truly left all alone, she's set her hope on God, continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. And you go, well, okay, what? What's he talking about there? Well, here's the thing. He says, first of all, we've got the philosophical basis in James. God says, hey, here, here's who I am. My very character is I look at the destitute, those that are needy, that are left alone. I want to care for them. I want to put them in family. I want them in community. That's what I designed you for. That's who I am, and that's what I want my family to work towards. But then he knows be, that we're sinners, and he says, so let's address the problems of greed and laziness, not just for women or widows, but for all of us. Because some of us go, oh, there's this person I should take care of. I don't want to. Laziness. Or I don't want to do it because it's going to cut into my retirement fund or my vacation fund. Greed. <laughs> so it's not, just, it's not just isolated to the women here that he's addressing in this context, but to all of us. Um, we find this, and you, I think you have it in your supplemental notes, um, in 2 Thessalonians, this principle is addressed. It says, listen, when Paul was there, he was instructing me, he said, if somebody's able to work and they're not willing to work, don't let them eat. Don't enable them. Don't support them. Because <laughs> God created us to be a part of His creation and working and doing things and providing for ourselves and being a help to others. He says, so if somebody's able to do that but they don't want to, don't enable them. That goes for all of us, not just women or just women who are widows. In verses 7 and 8, he says, this is an important he says, command these things so that they may be without reproach. If anyone doesn't provide for his relatives, especially for members of his household, he's denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. He said, this is an important part of our testimony of revealing who God is to the community around us. If we have His life in us, this should be bubbling out. This is how God's family operates. This is how He designed us. This flows out of His very character and nature. He says, and Jesus said this, He said, Here's how people will know that you're in my family, that you're my followers, you're my disciples, by your what? Love for each other. And again, that's not primarily warm fuzzies. <laughs> that when we see each other, we go, oh, I feel so good. <laughs> 
but how we interact with each other. He says, so this taking care of widows is going to be part of picturing who God is to the community around you. And and how serious is it here? He says, well, if you have this in your own bio family, your biological family, and you don't do it, you're worse than an unbeliever. What does that mean? You're worse than... What's worse than an unbeliever? Unbelievers are people who are enemies of God, who ignore Him, who don't pay any attention to what He says. What's worse than that? <laughs> I don't know, but it sounds bad, doesn't it? You, you, you can create your own picture there. He goes, you're worse. Ooh. Verses 9 and 10, then He says, so here's, here's what you do. And, he, and, he, and if we're not careful, again, we'll do this list of qualifications thing. He says, so she's got to be over, if you're going to support a widow as a church, not an individual, not me as a a family member, but as a church, as our church family, if we're going to support a widow, she's got to be at least 60 years old. And then he starts listing all this stuff. He says she's got to have been the wife of one husband, reputation for good works, and it starts listing all these things there. She's paid attention to her family. She's honored God's design for marriage. Um, She's been hospitable. She washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, devoted herself to every good work. It's very similar to what we saw with elders and deacons. This isn't, oh, I got a big checklist I got to do. You know, if you're, if you're approaching 60 and you're a woman and you, your husband's not in good health, you think like, oh, I better find someone's feet to wash so I can get support if I need it. That's not the idea. This is observably, this woman is walking with Christ. The life of Jesus is observable in her in her life every day, not just for an hour Sunday morning, which is pretty hard to observe all this stuff. It says, we see that God is in her, the life of Jesus. Not that she's perfect, but she's living a consistent life as a follower of Jesus. And that's what we want to focus on. So this is a normal walk with Christ here. And then verses 11 through 15. He goes on and says, well, here's what happens. And this, this, see if this doesn't make sense to you. When you lose a spouse, it's pretty traumatic normally, right? Yes? Traumatic. It's emotional. And when I'm, in, in, when I'm discouraged, when something traumatic, catastrophic has happened, or something that's very emotional, I'll tend to think this will never change, and, and I, I'll start making decisions about things that aren't necessarily realistic, but they're based on how I'm feeling right now long-term. He says, if you have younger widows, first of all, how were we designed? To live in community, to be in family. He says, so the tendency is going to be to make rash decisions or based on your feelings right then, which might be quite overwhelming and are are legitimate. He says, but then later on, you're going to find you're bucking your design and you're trying to fit it and say, I'll never get married again. I'll never find another person I want to spend the rest of my life with. He goes, yeah, you don't know what God's going to do. So just Hang on, especially you can work, go ahead, work and wait on it. Don't, and church, don't enable them because unfortunately what happens then later on when, when the emotion starts to fade or the trauma starts to fade, it says they might change their minds and go, oh, I don't really want to be alone. I want to find somebody else. And that's what he's talking about here. He says, and you're just kind of enabling them to do something that's not good, not only for them but for you as a church family. He says, so... Don't do that. The principle's up there in, in 2 Thessalonians. If they don't want to work, don't eat. <laughs> that doesn't mean we can't provide assistance for somebody that's going through a difficult time. You get what I'm saying? He says, as a church, don't take them on as somebody you're going to regularly support because you don't know what God has for them up ahead. And we don't want to put them in a position where they have to kind of fight against what they were originally designed for by God because anytime you and I deviate from what God's design and purpose is, and we ignore that, what happens? It's a mess, right? It's a mess, right? Look around. Not just in here, but out in our community too. It's a mess when we deviate from God's purpose and plan for our lives, right? He says, so don't, we don't want to enable that as a church. So verse 16, he, he gets to, he kind of summarizes what he's been covering here about the widows. And he says this, if any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Let the church not be burdened so it may care for those who are truly widows. In other words, take care of your family. If you see needs there, 
take care of them the way God would have you to. Whether they deserve it or not is not the issue. It's because of who they are in your life. Show them that respect, that honor. Take care of them. And then the church can focus on those as a family, as a group, those that really have needs that nobody's there for. They don't, their families abandon them. They have nobody to support them or there's no family existing. He says, then we can take them on. And so it keeps everybody focused on what God has for us, how we're to live out the life that he's given us. And as a church, when we take on somebody that's a widow that falls into these qualifications or the right context here, he says, what we're doing there really is we're showing them that we value them as older women. Maybe they can't get out and, and work, you know, enough in a regular, what we call more physical labor to support themselves, but we're showing, hey, we value you, we respect you, we want to have warmth of relationship here, and we want to support you if you really need it. We want to do that, but we're not just enabling you to just sit around and do nothing because we have work, we still have a place for you within the family. You can pray. You can be praying. You can do other things within our church family that can be a help to us that maybe you wouldn't make enough money doing that out, you know, in the public sector. But we want to show you that we value you. That's going to be a little different than the culture around us, isn't it? I think so. It's going to be an opportunity for people to see we're followers of Jesus. We're in his family because of the love, the actions we have towards one another. I, I, to show us, see, we see who God is in Jesus very specifically. He's revealed to us who He is. And as we look at what Jesus has done because of who He is, He's God, and we can see a real direct connection. How do we see God's heart for people to provide care, concern, value for people in family and community? Well, in Luke 7, we're not going to turn there, but you can read it through detailed Later, I just want to summarize it. Jesus is approached while he was here on earth. We see this just because of who he is, it comes out in this circumstance. He's going to a city called a town called Nain. His disciples and a bunch of people that were listening to his teaching were following him. And as he gets near the gate of the, the town, there's a man that's died, and they're bringing him out in the funeral possession, procession. And it turns out his mom's a widow, so she's already lost her husband. Now she's lost her only son, who would have been her kind of security person to care for her to make sure she wasn't taken advantage of, abused, exploited in, in that culture, and now he's gone. So she's alone. She's destitute. And, and it's interesting to note, because the details aren't in here just because he wants to round out the story, but it's to give us implications of what's going on. There's a great crowd following her, which would indicate she's probably lived a life that honors God, a godly life. So a lot of people like her, and they're, they're sad. They're sympathizing, commiserating with her in the loss of her son, and they know she's a widow. And Jesus sees this, and what does he do? He's, because of who he is, he's God. He's filled with compassion and concern. He says, this is not how it's supposed to be. And he goes up to the mom, and he says, don't, don't cry. Isn't that dumb? <laughs> You're at a funeral. <laughs> your husband's dead. They're carrying your only son to bury him. He says, don't cry. Why? He says, ah, oh, this is not how it's supposed to be. Don't cry, because it's going to get better. We're going to fix this. I, my very heart is to provide for you. And then he walks up and he touches the dead body. And you get the connection in the Jewish culture? I thought this guy was a smart teacher. What's he doing? He's making himself unclean. He's walking up and touching a dead body. And he says to the, the guy that's dead, he says, sit up. And the guy sits up and he starts talking. He goes, okay, here's your son back. What did Jesus do? It's a little bit different how it looked with Jesus, but it's the same thing we've just been reading in Timothy. He provides for the widow. He shows her that she's valued, that she's respected by him, the creator of the universe. And then what's the result if you read that? It says everybody was afraid and people started glorifying God saying, hey, a great prophet has arisen among us or God has visited his, his people. And the, and the report started spreading all over the place. He said, this is weird. God, ha This has to be God. This is showing us who God is. If we do what God tells us to as a family because of who we are in Jesus, not to get there, not to be accepted by God, will people around us go, well, oh, that's weird. What's going on with that? And will it give it us opportunities to glorify God and share the good news about Jesus? Yeah, which is one of our primary focuses here on earth, right? Should be. 
Psalm 68, verses 5 and 6 says this. This again reveals God's heart to us. Father of the fatherless, protector of widows, is God in His holy habitation. God settles the solitary in a home. He leads out the prisoners to prosperity. God's design is for us to be in community, loving community. But the rebellious dwell in a parched land. God's design is for community, especially family, and He works to make that a reality for all that are His, whether they have a biological family or not. That's why He's given us a spiritual family. That's one of the aspects, one of the benefits of what God's done for us. Jesus said this, and again, so we understand this, it's His very nature of who He is. In, in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, Jesus speaking, I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation. Jesus says this, take my yoke upon you, let me teach you because I am, what? Humble. I don't think of myself more than I am or less. I'm humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Anybody here needs rest for your soul today? <laughs> Jesus has the answers. So what do we do with this? Let me give you just a couple uh, suggestions very quickly. One or two or all may apply to you. First of all, interaction with leadership, which was covered in the first couple of verses. Everyone leads someone. Everyone leads someone. So, you might ask yourself, what is God teaching me about my approach to those who I lead? Is my attitude the same as His, like the attitude of Jesus? If not, what steps will I take to move towards the attitude of Jesus? Also, everybody has leaders over them. So, you can also ask yourself, and I can ask myself, what's my attitude towards those who lead me? What's God teaching me today about my approach towards those who lead me? And if it's not reflecting really who God is in me, what steps will I take to move towards that attitude? And here's, again, the signal is this. When leaders see you coming, what do you provoke? Joy or groaning? Oh, there they come again. <laughs> or is it, wow, there's that guy. Man, I can't wait to talk to him. Then second, care of widows, which is the bulk of what we looked at this morning. Are there any widows in my family that I need to care for? Or are there potential widows coming along the lines that might need some assistance and care? And am I taking steps to prepare for that care if it's needed? And then for us as a church family, and this especially applies to elders and pastors, are there, are there any widows in our church family that need to be cared for? We need to know that. We need to know the people that are part of our church family. And are we prepared to provide care for them if they need it. And then, although the context was women today, this can be true for all of us. Am I living in a way that my walk with Jesus, that He lives in me, is evident to others? Am I doing that? Or do, would, if somebody was going to put me on trial for being a follower of Jesus and being in God's family, would they really have to dig for evidence? <laughs> if so, that's a problem. It's an issue might wonder whether God's Spirit's really in you because it's just going to be bubbling out, he says. It's going to be seeping out. And if you're thinking, as we, you've heard some stuff today, how can I get around this? I don't really want to do that. How can I get around? Go back and read that portion in Mark 7 again about how Jesus dealt with people that were looking for loopholes and how to get around what God has told us in His design. I need to be asking myself, God, how can I carry out what you've said? How can I better reflect who you are in my life rather than how can I get around it or get away from it or ignore it. And then finally this, you might be hearing you're living in a parched land. <laughs> you're not in a spiritual family. It's just dry and uh, you wonder at times, what's the point of life? Or I just feel isolated and alone. God says, regardless of what your biological family is, I have a family for you. It's not perfect here, but it's going to get there. You can have that. If you don't know who Jesus is or you've never made a trust commitment decision to accept Him as your Savior and follow Him as your Lord, your King, your older brother under your heavenly Father, we're going to have some elders over here at the end of the service. Come up and ask them about that or they'll be glad to pray with you. They'll pray with you about anything, anybody, but in particular, I want to encourage you. If you have questions about that, get those settled today. If you're not in the family of Jesus, why? You, you like living in the desert? You go out to California every once in a while, there's different routes you can take. The one I like the least is the southern one. <laughs> it's hot all the time. 
So God says, listen, here's who I am. Look, you can see it revealed in my actions, especially in Jesus. Now I've made you part of my family because of what Jesus did. That's who you are. That will inform how we live. Let's pray. Father, thanks for your love to us. Thanks for your clarity and your word. Thanks for your spirit who not only teaches us, but enables us to to live out this life that you've given us. You live in us so that we can be like you. Help us to do that. If Again, if there's somebody here that doesn't know Jesus as their Savior, is not part of your family, that they would settle that question today or at least start asking uh, questions and, and pursue the issue and not just walk out and continue to live in the desert. So we look to you, Father, for that. We thank you for the opportunity to be here together this morning. And we're just appreciative of all that you've given us in Jesus. It's in his name that we come to you.